Good evening and welcome to the MyCP webinar series. I'm your host. My name is Paul Gross. Very excited to have Dr. Adam Ostendorf here to talk to us about uh, his work as a neurologist and epileptologist and the work that he's done to uh, surveil uh, epilepsy and CP treatments uh, in the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. So I'm going to take us through a quick introduction to the CP Research Network and then turn it over to Rostendorf to talk about CP and the CP and Epilepsy Registry and his uh, findings of the last uh, 24 months. Uh, okay, so CPRN and CP Now, two organizations came together. Uh, we're born out of the same meeting, really. We were born out of an NIH uh, meeting. Oops, sorry. Break my mouse and this is what happens. Uh, we're born out of an NIH workshop that happened in November, 2024. Pardon me, I'm just gonna mute everyone. Uh, and out of that meeting came five key objectives. Uh, start a national CP registry, do more research that compared all the interventions that people with CP got uh, increase the study of adults, bring more young clinician scientists into the field, uh, and then to really advance uh, also the science of CP and not just the, the clinical care. Uh, so the Cerebral Palsy Research Network was born out of looking at those and deciding what to do. And we started with a registry and we just expanded to take on all uh, five of those uh, challenges that were set out of that 2014 meeting. Uh, Michelle Schusterman was a another parent of a child with CP attending that same meeting. And she incorporated uh, in 2015 to create an educational not-for-profit that would also fund research. Uh, she found it very difficult to find evidence-based uh, information that was consumable by lay people uh, once she got a diagnosis of CP. She's also been very, was always very focused on the uh, care of both the person with CP, but the family supporting the person with CP. Uh, and so we came together in the beginning of 2021. We had two websites uh, each. So we took our four websites and combined them and decided to come together under the name, the CP Research Network. So our mission is to optimize the lifelong health and wellness of people with cerebral palsy and their families through high quality research, education, and then community programs. So some key milestones uh, of, the, of the merged organization uh, on the education front, which is one of our core pillars, we launched the CP Toolkit in late 2015. We've had uh, more than 4,000 of those distributed both through hospitals and downloaded off of our website. Uh, we released a well-being guide uh, for caregivers uh, to do some self-care. And then we translated the toolkit into Spanish and Portuguese in 2017. Uh, and then we released MyCP in 2020, which is a web personalization service uh, that makes it really much easier for people to get information uh, about, you know, what from our wealth of information is most pertinent to them. From a research perspective, we did do that first goal from that NIH meeting and we launched a clinical registry in March of 2016. It now has over 5,200 patients in it and it kind of goes and grows in leaps and bounds when it grows as uh, the sites come on board and bring their patient population into the registry. Uh, one of the first projects we did was we, we got some funding to do a patient-centered research agenda. So we brought about 200 people together over the web and then with a collaborative voting system and then came together in Chicago with a, an agenda that we published in 2018, which sets the top 16 areas for research. In CP, and that really sets our agenda for the network. Uh, we've had significant public uh, funding milestones, including uh, for uh, genetics uh, with an NIH study, and then Dr. Ostendorf got funding for uh, adding the epilepsy support to the registry. And so he's one of the one of the two principal investigators in the network that's uh, successfully gotten funding so far. Uh, we launched four quality improvement initiatives. Quality improvement is another way to improve outcomes. It's just doesn't do it by doing sort of five-year studies or multi-year studies. It does it by incrementally uh, improving the system of healthcare to improve outcomes. And we've had five publications, more than 20 academic presentations. Uh, and we've got, uh, actually I need to update the seven plus manuscripts. We've got 
two manuscripts uh, accepted uh, with revisions uh, and uh, five more that are under development right now. Uh, and then on the wellness front, we launched a virtual wellness program in mid-2021 that we do with Staying Driven, two, two days a week of an hour of free adaptive exercise. Uh, and we partnered with the National Center for Health, Physical Activity and Disability to bring their mentor program, which is mindfulness, uh, exercise, and nutrition to optimize resilience, to bring that specifically to the CP community. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we basically are a big collaborative group of people that is not only the institutions, but the clinicians, therapists, people that are just dedicated to research and uh, patient families and people with CP that are just advocating for improving outcomes. We have a physical data coordinating center where the data from our registries, which are just databases of information about people come together. Uh, and we have two registries, actually a clinical registry, which captures data from your visit to a clinician about your uh, cerebral palsy. And then one that captures surveys from people uh, from their home or from their uh, mobile phone um, in the interest of um, learning more things outside of the community. And then uh, we have education and well being programs. My CP is a big one of these. I, if you're not already a member, I recommend that you join. It's free, it's this personalized web portal, uh, but it also offers the opportunity to participate in our community registry through surveys. It allows you to engage clinicians and researchers in what you think is important about research. Uh, and it provides access to our wellness program. So you can sign up at mycp.org. So just to give you an idea about these two different registries, they capture different kinds of information, but some similar information about people with CP. This is the distribution of people with one measure or one uh, classification scale. So this is the gross motor function classification scale, which is really, or uh, it's actually a classification system, which is really just a measurement of one through five. And that talks about how people move through the community. Do they move with assisted, assistive devices? Uh, if they move with uh, a wheelchair, do they do it? Um, under their own power, or do they need uh, support, more support for their body? So you see the distribution that is in our clinical registry, which has a little, I mean, I'm sorry, our community registry, which has a little over a thousand people at this stage. And then for comparison point, here's the same data point that is uh, found in our clinical registry. So you see the N here, we have 4,400, it's not our full, 5,200 that I mentioned, but you see the distribution is more like a U and this is actually more, this is not a population view. It's not sampled in a way that you could generalize to the population, but this distribution is a little closer to what you would see uh, in the population, but it represents people that come to hospitals to be seen for care, both, uh, uh, both peds and adults. So that's, those are our programs. We're very focused on engaging the community and research that matters. Uh, on the right, you see uh, our, our group of investigators from our last in-person meeting, which was May of 2019. We're very excited to be getting together in May of 2022 in Chicago. Uh, and we offer a number of resources for education and we're starting to build out programs for health and well-being like Mentor and ICP Fitness. Uh, so we are all across the US. The green pins represent sites that are actively collecting data into the registry. The yellow pins are working on uh, some of the uh, compliance uh, work that's necessary. Red pins are, are um, I'm sorry, the red pins are compliance and doing some of the IT. The uh, yellow pins are, are working on just you know, the, technological work to get the registry up and running. And then we've got several candidate sites uh, all across the country. And in fact, we have a new candidate site in Chicago, which is Lori Children's has expressed interest in joining the network. Uh, so we, we exist to accelerate research and then to take that evidence and those outcomes and roll them back into clinical practice. 
This is our pipeline that we've developed where on the left, you see the wide part of the funnel where people are just brainstorming ideas about how to solve problems that are on that research CP agenda. And then they get moved along to a specific idea, a specific question. They get approved by our investigator committee and then they go on to either be implemented or to apply for funding depending on the, the level of the study. Uh, and then they go through into study execution we have findings, we publish those findings, and then we roll the evidence back into the practice. The uh, blue, blue circles are research studies. The orange circles are quality improvement, these ones that improve outcomes by uh, standardizing practice uh, within uh, the clinical care. So with that, I am excited uh, to turn it over to Dr. Adam Ostendorf, who's a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics and neurology at Ohio State. Uh, and he's the director of the epilepsy, he's, I think it's co-director actually, uh, with, of the epilepsy surgery team uh, at Nationwide. And he is the principal investigator on our epilepsy core uh, in CPRN. So with that introduction, I turn it over to Dr. Ostendorf. Let me stop sharing so you can, ooh, let me get my mouse to work. Thanks, Paul. All right. Yeah, no worries. All right. Uh, again, um, my name is Adam Ostendorf. I'm an associate professor at Nationwide Children's Hospital in The Ohio State University. I think we have a few Michigan folks on the phone, but they're on the video call, but uh, we'll agree to get along for the next little bit. Uh, I've been asked to talk about cerebral palsy and epilepsy and give an update on what's going on in the CP Research Network from that standpoint. Um, I wanna take, this, uh, take a minute to just highlight um, the support that uh, all of the work that Paul's done and, and, and the support folks have done from the CPRN to really make, um, move forward a, a, a really needed area of learning and, and research study to, to, to move forward to improve the way we can take care of our, our patients. Um, and then I also wanna thank the Pediatric Epilepsy Research Foundation that funded um, some of the work that we're about to, to go through. So goals for tonight, um, my hope is that uh, we can all learn a little bit about epilepsy, uh, learn how epilepsy affects uh, people with cerebral palsy, and then learn some ways that we're um, identifying through the work in CPRN uh, that we might be able to improve care for, um, for these folks. So what is epilepsy? Um, epilepsy is a condition of recurrent seizures. So uh, your brain makes electricity, just like your muscles make electricity, your heart makes electricity, your skin and your gut make electricity. Pretty much your whole body is this electricity making uh, system and your brain is typically making electricity in a very uh, regulated way. So the functional networks, the brain networks talk to each other sort of in a very orderly fashion. And a seizure is when that electricity, the um, electricity messaging between the brain cells really goes overboard, really becomes um, out of control. And when that happens, people can lose consciousness, they can have shaking of their bodies. Um, it can be brief lasting less than a, a second, or it can be prolonged lasting hours, days, or sometimes even weeks. So. This is a, a very common uh, condition. Epilepsy affects one in every 26 people. So 4% of the world's population will have or has epilepsy. Here at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we take care of about 5,600 people with epilepsy. Um, and it's the, one of the most common reasons to, reasons to be admitted to our hospital. Uh, I think it's number six right now as far as why people are admitted um, uh, to Nationwide Children's Hospital. When I think of a seizure, so I'm an epileptologist, I like brain waves, I really like lines that are squiggly. And this is an example of a you know pretty normal, typical EEG. So when we read EEG, we're measuring the electricity in the brain 
And this is an example of somebody who looks pretty drowsy to me, um, but they're awake and it's normal EEG. And then when um, a seizure happens, uh, it gets really abnormal. So this is an example of a seizure coming from this person's uh, left side where the seizure become, the brain waves become sharp and they lose like the normal characters, the characteristics that we typically see. So seizures, I do this all day, every day is just take care of folks who have seizures and read brain waves and, because it's so darn common. Um, well, how do we take care of people with epilepsy? Well, the first thing is always medicine, right? Like you come to a doctor, you're probably going to get a medicine. You go to a surgeon, they're probably going to do a surgery, but you come to come to us and we're going to, we're going to use medicine. So if I have 10 people come to my clinic and all 10 of them have seizures that are continuing because they haven't started a medicine. Um, when we try medicine number one, we're going to control the seizures, meaning no more seizures for four out of 10. So 40% treatment success. That's not horrible, but it's really not wonderful either. So then we might try medicine number two and two more people will have seizure freedom. So six out of 10 will have seizure freedom. But what do we do with these four folks who are on medicines, but still having seizures? Well, we might try medicine three, four, five, six, 28 different medicines we use for epilepsy. And if we try all 28 different medicines in different combinations, we might someday get that other one other person seizure free but no matter what medicines we try three out of ten folks with epilepsy are going to continue to have seizures and we call that medically intractable epilepsy so when people are not seizure free on medicines it's intractable or drug resistant epilepsy this is a really really tough condition and so if you take these four folks what can we do for them well, we can we can offer them epilepsy surgery, and in certain folks, up to ninety percent can be cured from their epilepsy. No more seizure medicines, no more seizures. Um, and in some people, they might respond really well to something called the ketogenic diet, where even though medicines aren't working, this can help thirty percent of people who won't be otherwise helped by medicines. So there's lots of different ways. We can try to address um, seizures in, in people, and these are unfortunately underutilized, and especially in the CP, um, in, in people with CP, and, and we've learned some of that from the CPRN. Um, well, how does epilepsy impact people? How do seizures impact people? It's very broad, right? So it's very easy to imagine somebody who is um, doing something, they have a seizure, and they might get hurt from having that seizure because they can't control their body. Um, and that's a common um, scenario where injuries are increased in people with epilepsy. There's this thing called sudden unexplained death in epilepsy or SUDEP, where people who are otherwise pretty healthy suddenly pass away. And that is a really scary thing. It really happens. Um, and the best way we can do, uh, try to control that is, is to completely control the seizures. And then epilepsy impacts people by um, reducing their quality of life. This thing that we try to measure in lots of different ways where we say, okay, this person has a better quality of life. Their stressors are lower. Their um, level of function is higher, their um, interaction with their environment is better um, compared to this other person. And we use lots and lots of different tr tools to try to quantify that. Because at the end of the day, as doctors, we often don't cure disease, magically make things better. But what we can really do is try our best to make people's lives better. Um, and and that's, that's the goal um, many, many times. So why should we study epilepsy and cerebral palsy together? Well, epilepsy is common, right? 4% of people have epilepsy. But in people with CP, that jumps to 35 to 50%. So it's a really common condition in people with cerebral palsy, which means that it affects a lot of folks. And unfortunately, um, it's, it, it's a population, it's a group of people who we don't know enough about how to take better care of them. And so there's a really big need to try to better understand the seizures that happen in people with cerebral palsy. 
Um, another reason to study epilepsy and CP together is that people with cerebral palsy, they have seizures, they're usually tougher to treat, right? I took you through that list and, um, and, and th uh, three to four people out of every 10 will have intractable epilepsy. Um, if you look at folks with cerebral palsy, that number balloons up to 50 to 60%. Um, so it tends to be harder to treat and seizures just in general make life harder. So if you layer all of those things onto somebody, um, if we do a better job, if, if I do a better job of taking care of, of my patients, um, then their lives hopefully will get better. But we need to know more. For instance, we don't know how often people with cerebral palsy continue to have seizures despite trying medicines. We think it's probably 50 to 60% of the time, but we don't know that number as well as we should. We don't know how people are being treated. Are we using medicines more? Are we using surgeries more? Are we using ketogenic diet more? What's better? What treatment might be better? Um, in, in folks with cerebral palsy. And then we also don't know very well how all of these things layer together to change somebody's life. How does cerebral palsy, epilepsy, other problems, feeding problems potentially, how do all of those conditions group together to, to affect somebody's quality of life? And so because we don't even know these things, we need to figure out how to um, study them, how to measure them. Well, we do know things about, uh, we do know some things about health-related quality of life, that quality of life thing. We do know about it in people with epilepsy, and we do know about it with people in cerebral palsy. So when we think about it just in people with epilepsy or people in, with just epilepsy, um, we know that if uh, people have poorly controlled seizures. So if you have any seizures a year, your quality of life is gonna be worse. Um, if people have had epilepsy for a long time, have mental health concerns like anxiety or depression, have poor, poor peer support, um, and then their development and functional status, all of these things can lower quality of life in people with epilepsy. Well, what about people with cerebral palsy? We know that level of function, GMFCS, um, so the higher the GMFCS score, up to four or five, means more dependence on um, others for mobility and technology for mobility. And that tends to decrease quality of life in folks with cerebral palsy. We know that increasing pain, more difficulty with communication, feeding problems, being admitted to the hospitals, and seizures um, all impact the measured quality of life in people with cerebral palsy. So we're seeing an interaction between the two that those circles of the Venn diagram truly do overlap. People with epilepsy have worse quality of life when their level of function is lower, and people with cerebral palsy have lower function the quality of life when their seizures, when they have seizures and their seizures are poorly controlled. Well, how do we learn more about this? Typically, um, clinician scientists like myself, we first always try to describe the problems to get our head wrapped around what's the size of the problem, the scope of the problem, how do these things interact? And then just like anybody, we really like to fix things if we can. So first we wanna identify the problem and scope the problem. And then we wanna to try to um, think very carefully about uh, ways that we might be able to fix the problems. And that's where the CPRN reg data registry has been incredibly um, helpful and, and um, really transformative in how we can do epilepsy um, related research in, in people with CP uh, and, do, and try to do better. So how do we do this? Paul gave a really nice overview. The way I think of it as a clinician and scientist is we wanna collect information when I'm doing a clinical visit, and then we wanna save it in a way that we can learn from it later on. So you come to the clinic visit, you see um, a, a physician, then um, you know all physicians, we all have to write our medical notes um, to document what happened at the time of care. 
And so this, oh wait, no, that's not um, what we're supposed to look like when we write our notes. Um, we're supposed to look like this when we write our notes and we put it in the computer. And so we take all this information, we put it in the computer. And so it's all stored there. And then, you know, like a good clinician scientist, we wanna do research on it. Oh, uh, and not that, but this, you know, we're trying to develop questions and think about how we can learn from the information that we've gathered and do better. So what are we learning? These are just a few samples of things that we're, we've been able to learn over the last um, couple of years working together with CPRN. So, you know, for instance, who's at highest risk for developing seizures? We know from a pretty robust signal that if people have a GMFCS of five, so um, the sort of highest level of dependence on either technology and others for mobility, um, they're much more likely, four times more likely to have seizures than somebody who has um, very minimal mobility, um, functional mobility needs. Somebody who has a GMFCS of four is two and a half times more likely to have seizures. So this is helping us identify who's the highest risk, who should we be doing, you know, spending a little extra time um, going over seizure risks um, and things like anticipatory guidance. You don't have seizures now, but in the future, if you have seizures, here's what to do. Okay, all of that takes time. And if we can target that better during a clinic visit, we've done a better job taking care of our patients. We know that increasing GMFCS score is associated with worse seizure control. So a GMFCS of one, 96% um, uh, of them have their seizures under control. In this cohort, um, GMFCS of five, 22% of folks had uncontrolled seizures. All right, so 78% were controlled, 22% were not. So now we're identifying not just those who have seizures or higher risk for seizures, but also those who we have to kind of keep a closer eye on and, and maybe have more frequent visits or um, try um, uh, to um, use some of the you know, bigger medicine treatments or bigger therapies for if the seizures are getting under uh, out of control. The other thing that we've learned from this registry is that um, even though uh, about 40% of people with epilepsy may need to be evaluated for surgery and about 15% um, or actually probably 30% of folks will need um, epilepsy surgery, only 1.5%, so a very tiny fraction, have, it, have had access to that in our network. And that's um, also, there's some other studies that show that that's, those numbers are probably pretty true. So it tells us that our, our patients with, um, with uh, cerebral palsy and epilepsy are definitely not getting the full scope of care that we would hope that they have access to, including things that might cure their epilepsy. Okay. So we're learning things from CPRN. We're learning, we're describing the problem, but as we're looking at the data coming in, we're saying, well, gosh, this is making a lot more questions. So, for instance, how do we diagnose seizures better in these people who are at higher risk? How do we control seizures better um, if we're not controlling pay, uh, seizures in all people? How can we do better? And how do we improve the quality of life? How do we make people, out of all the things that we can do for them, how can we make lives better? That's where um, this other part of uh, this other benefit of, of being involved with CPRN comes in. So um, Uni uh, Narayanan from Toronto Sick Kids is an orthopedic surgeon who has put a ton of time and effort and energy um, and thought into trying to sort out um, how we can measure um, a caregiver's uh, um, perception of the ease of care the comfort, the health, and the overall well-being of um, a person they're taking care of with cerebral palsy. 
So he and a lot of other folks worked on this thing called the CP Child, which is a questionnaire um, that helps us better understand how people's health-related quality of life or these different things are, um, how, how good they are or how not good they are. So it gets our attention when we see these numbers low and we say, okay, we need to really focus on it, helping this get better. And so because of the work that um, Paul's done and the rest of the folks have done with the registry, we have this tool that we can use to try to say, okay, are we doing a good job of, of helping this person have the best quality of life they can? So we used um, the computer system that we have to, to do all those fun notes of, um, when we're seeing patients in the clinic to also gather information from patients. So when people come into our clinic, they sit down with a, a tablet or they may have gotten something in, the, in an electronic message system. Um, and then they, it's a very brief form, takes a few minutes to fill out. That gives us information when we go into the clinic room with them, but it also then helps us store this information so that we can learn from it later. So patients and families receive this questionnaire and then we can use this information to focus on certain areas. And then we can learn as we put that information together with other things. So they might get uh, a form and then they get their CP child and then they get feedback what their CP child scores might look like compared to normative values. So they're getting all of this information back to them so they can help understand where they are better. And then um, we can move forward in, in um, taking care of them. Well, this has turned into one of the manuscripts that Paul has um, was mentioning earlier, where we were able to collect information from 160 children and young adults in a very short amount of time, which is fantastic. Um, and we found that CP child scores were lower if they had any seizures at all, not just you know the ones that had 10 seizures a month compared to five seizures a month, but any seizures, lower quality of life. Um, hospital admissions for epilepsy, yep, that decreased CP child scores. Um, higher GMFCS level, decreased CP child scores, and more medicines. Interestingly, independent of how many seizures somebody was having, if they were on three medicines or four medicines or five medicines for epilepsy or even more, their scores went down, 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 down. And this is a very new finding. This is a very, from my standpoint, a very um, important finding because it might give us a clue of what we could do to do better for our patients. So how do we use this information to help people? Well, maybe we move forward with a careful, careful, carefully uh, um, designed study to test if decreasing some of the medicines for seizures improves CP child scores. We've got this tool, the CP child, we've got this network, CPRN to collect and in, in store information. And we've got some data that tells us that we might actually do better for people if we decrease some of their medicines. And people who take medicines, this seems intuitive. Um, but for doctors who prescribe medicine, this is not intuitive. So this is a really important next step where we might be able to now help people um, and prove that we can help people by doing this in a very carefully designed way. In addition, um, we know that people will have fewer seizures if they have successful surgery. We know that people with CP and epilepsy have a really low rate of access to surgery. So maybe we should test ways to improve access to better treatments like epilepsy surgery. Um, when we asked or looked at barriers to epilepsy surgery, we found that barriers are on our part, on the clinician's part, not recognizing that surgery might be helpful from the systems part of not having access to the right institutions or the right resources at the institutions. Um, and then also from the patients and families perspectives, fear of surgery, um, maybe a, a misconception that surgery is gonna be, you know, 
very harmful or change somebody's personality or something like that. So this gives us information that, yep, these are problems. Here's the scope of the problem. And then maybe here are some ideas on how to address the problems or start addressing some of the problems. So uh, sort of a, um, an example to highlight both of these things in a patient I take care of with cerebral palsy and epilepsy. So this gal is 18. She has GMFCS5 spastic quadriplegia. Um, when I met her, she had been having daily seizures since she was two years old. Daily full body tonic clonic seizures. So big full convulsions several times a day um, for years and years. And in the past, she had been said, you know, people said, well, there's not really much we can do. We're just going to keep trying medicines. So by the time I saw her, she was taking five anti-seizure medicines. And when I met her, I actually met her in the ICU and she was in the ICU with um, this prolonged seizure here. This is called status epilepticus. And it, in, in this, um, EEG, it's from the right temporal lobe. And when we look at her right temporal lobe here, this is a scar called mesial temporal sclerosis. It's not going to be on a test later, I promise. But this to me is saying, okay, the seizures are coming from the scarred area in her brain. The rest of her brain is not perfect. It's not totally normal, but this is definitely a bad spot and it's doing bad things. Other than the five anti-seizure medicines that she's on, can we do something for her? So we did this thing called an MRI guided laser hippocampotomy, where through a very small incision in the back of the head, a catheter is put into the hippocampus. Very intense light is emitted from the tip of the catheter and it vaporizes the scarred tissue through a tiny little hole this size. This is a newer technology that didn't exist when she was two years old or three years old, but it's not experimental by any means. And now we use it um, on a regular basis. So she had a tiny little incision, tiny, I mean, there's a longer surgery, but um, through it and she recovered in a day or two and went home. Since then, she's been seizure free for over three years. She's totally off of all of her anti-seizure medications. And when I saw her last, her CP child scores were in the top seventh or, or top seven or eight percent of all of the patients that we take care of. And so this is an example of, hey, maybe we should be taking the information we're learning from the CP Research Network and applying it to more folks like me. So with that, um, I'm going to wind down and. Uh, open it up to any questions you might have or comments you might have um, regarding any of the things I've talked about or other things that might have popped up along the way. Well, th thank you so much, Adam. I really feel like we should have done the wave at that. Like that story is so compelling. Um, it's a great, a great place to end. And so uh, let me, um, I see Duncan's hand is up. I know I've got some questions. Uh, so Duncan, why don't you go first and people can either put their hand up or when Duncan's done, they can start to speak up or put a question in the, in the chat. Uh, kind of a three part question, you know, I'll go one part at a time. Is there a significant gender differential, male, female? with regards to having epilepsy? Uh, yeah, CPs who present with epilepsy. Yeah, it, that's a good question. It, it, um, in research that was done a while ago, it looked like uh, males had a, high, a slightly higher risk for having both CP and epilepsy. And in some of the more recent research, it looks like it's pretty equal. Okay, second part would be the onset of puberty. Does the onset of puberty uh, uh, um, have a, 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 any type of measurable impact on seizure occurrence? Yeah, um, so obviously the brain changes a lot during puberty. 
um, for the good and for the bad. And all of those changes also affect epilepsy. Um, it's more common for uh, epilepsy to change in girls who are going through puberty because estrogen is a pro-convulsant hormone. So as estrogen is, is levels are rising, um, uh, young women may have more seizures. Um, so it, it's interesting though, because some seizure types will improve during puberty and abate over time. And some seizure types are going to worsen during puberty. And the net in folks who have cerebral palsy who typically have more, um, we call focal or structural epilepsy, most of the time in those instances, we'd expect it to get worse during puberty. So- And then, then I guess the, the, the third part is maybe the hardest, uh, uh, determine. Um, is there anything in your studies that indicates that there's a higher occurrence of epilepsy uh, if the, um, the trauma to the brain is post-delivery uh, post as opposed to, say, uh, um, a trauma during delivery? Yeah, wow, that's a really good question. We don't know that yet. Uh, I, I don't know, it, you know, my hope is that we'll have enough granular data over time with registries like CPRN um, to, to answer that, that question better, but we don't know the answer. That's a really good question. And I guess what drives that is, is certainly when I was much younger, um, a two or three year old who experienced a traumatic brain injury uh, would automatically end up being labeled cerebral palsy. And that age has been consistently coming down. And I would think that some type of traumatic brain injury in those first several years of development would, would, would have an impact on on uh, predisposition to epilepsy, but that's just speculation on my part. That's a very good idea. Very good. Um, that's good speculation. Amber, you are up. Um, yeah, two questions. The first one being, um, as far as like CBD oil, um, has that been helpful in high doses or is there a dose that, that has been um, determined that, that helps seizures? Because I know there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of parents who are, who are trying that. Yeah, great question. Um, so there's a medicine out there that's been FDA approved called cannabidiol or Epidiolex. And it's a highly concentrated um, delivery system essentially for cannabidiol for CBD oil, um, as opposed to you know CBD oil that's uh, not FDA re regulated. So the data for sort of over the counter or you know um, non regulated CBD oil is really hard. It's hard to say even if that's true CBD oil versus canola oil versus something else. Um, so the, the, the data that I know comes from the Epidiolex studies. Um, Epidiolex wasn't discreetly studied in folks with cerebral palsy, but it was studied in people who have pretty severe epilepsy, Lanx-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome. In the short term, it seemed to help about half of people by half. So about 50% of people who took the medicine instead of a placebo um, had their seizures go from maybe 10 seizures a month to five seizures a month, or, you know, um, in some cases, 10 seizures a day to five seizures a day. And then the other half of folks were not helped by the medicine. That is a very um, sort of inline response that we typically see across pretty much every anti-seizure medicine study. So it, so, this, so CBD um, compared to pretty much any other medicine that we have available, CBD is about middle of the road effectiveness. The thing where 
myself and most of the folks who practice um, it, that bothers us is that in the CBD studies, both in Lex Gusto and the Dravet study, um, whereas in previous studies, about 1% of people will drop out because of bad side effects. In the CBD studies, about 16% of people dropped out because of severe side effects. So it's something that we consider sort of middle of the road effectiveness, and it had a much higher side effect profile compared to most of our other medicines. Actually, it was the worst out of all the medicines we have FDA approved. Um, so a lot of us use CBD as a you know very low um, choice because we'd rather pick something that's less likely to bother our patients or harm our patients. If somebody wants to be on it, you know, if, if they want to try it, I certainly don't say no as long as it's reasonable and indicated. But for the most part, it's been somewhat, actually, it's been quite disappointing in the long run for taking care of our folks. Amber, okay, you have a and then, question? Yeah, yeah, and then the other question is, um, do you see seizures get better as children get older and if they do because i know of one adult who has like just stopped taking seizure medication altogether do they still have a higher incidence of death if they do have a seizure seizure if they're off their medication oh man that's an awesome question unfortunately they do they have a, a much higher risk for sudep if they're off anti-seizure medicines um in fact the one study that i um, typically refer back to it's a 27 time 27 times greater risk for sudden unexplained death and epilepsy off of anti-seizure medicines with continued seizures. Um, so it's it's a it's a really tremendous um, risk as far as the likelihood of coming uh, of of seizures abating over time um, from childhood into adulthood. It can happen. But if there is a structural problem with the brain, it's much less likely to happen. If the brain is normal and it's a generalized epilepsy, about a third of them will outgrow it. If the brain has a structural problem, then the likelihood of outgrowing it, is, it runs around 10 to 15%. Great question. Thank you. Uh, Adam, while you're on the topic of suit up, uh, this is just like, something to clarify from a conversation I had a long time ago. Do, is the mechanism of why someone dies from epilepsy known? Like, is it that they stop breathing or do they not, is it not known? It is not known. Um, it's probably different for different folks. So there's, um, there's a, a large amount of research going into this. There are at least a dozen mouse models of SUDEP with different genes that have been knocked out. And those genes are related to the respiratory drive from the brainstem, but also other genes are associated with um, cardiac arrhythmias or, um, or, or the conduction system of electricity in the heart. So um, we think that there is a component of breathing for some people. Um, and then there's a component of, um, of uh, heart stopping suddenly during, um, or not actually during the seizure, but actually after the seizure. Hmm. Yeah, I, I recall someone saying to me, and I don't remember, you know, who it was, but that you wouldn't die from stopping breathing because lower brain stem, you know, that a, a seizure was a higher uh, brain function and that a lower brain stem would stop it. And, and I was like, hmm. Seems to be contradictory with this thing called pseudo. Yeah, so, it's yeah, yeah, that's true. Yep. Okay. Uh, are there other questions in the group? I, I I would like to ask a question about you gave a you showed an image very early on about um, the impact of surgery, and you know I've looked at lots of brain scans because of hydrocephalus, but I was looking at it and I was not clear, it was not clear to me if you could say what was done surgically in that scan. And I don't know if that was clear. It was sort of like your second or third slide in. Um, I would be, I'd be curious if you can just, this? especially now that you've, uh, yes, hold on one second. Yeah. Let me get my screen so that I can see it. I made it so that the, uh, 
slide is small. Yes, that. Yeah. So this is the best surgery that we can do. So this person had uh, probably a, a, we would call an MCA tear, a middle cerebral artery territory stroke when they were a child, a, an infant, um, uh, which unfortunately is not uncommon. It's a common cause for hemiplegic cerebral palsy. And this is, these are the, the people that are most likely to benefit from having an epilepsy surgery. And what happened is this child had a, 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 perifun a periinsular functional hemispherotomy. So the entire hemisphere is disconnected from the body and from the other side of the brain. And that what that does is it isolates the seizures. So if the seizures continue here in this tissue in the occipital lobe, it's been disconnected from everything else. It's not going to hurt the person. And the person's, the consequences of a surgery like this are hemiplegia, but often these folks already have hemiplegia. And what and, are the, are there cognitive uh, impacts of that disconnection? So most of the time in the studies, you see um, uh, neuropsychology testing scores go up. So wow. people, so 12 months after um, uh, hemispherotomy like this, when it's been published, you see scores improve. And anecdotally, that's definitely something that we see an awful lot of because what happens in the interim is seizures are controlled or gone. The other side of the brain gets to do its work unaffected by all the bad seizures and seizure medicines are being reduced. And so it's, it's one of the most satisfying things that we can do because these are so effective and in people mm. who already are used to having the, the motor dis, uh, uh, dysfunction, so the cerebral palsy part of it, we don't make that worse. We just make their thinking clearer. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's great. So in the interest of being egalitarian, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Novacek to ask his questions and, and then we'll come back to uh, Amber and Duncan. Yeah, thanks, Paul and uh, Adam, th for a great evening. I really enjoyed it. Um, Adam, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about uh, what are the barriers to access for individuals with cerebral palsy for uh, seizure management and uh, particularly for the type of seizure management that you were talking about tonight uh, for the intractable seizures uh, going on to surgical intervention? What, what are the major barriers there? Yeah, that's a, um, a big topic. So it's um, something we've written a couple systematic reviews uh, on recently. And in cerebral palsy specifically, I can't um, pull that out because nobody has studied it, uh, which is a, a gap and an opportunity. Um, in the general population, um, and then you know, reinforced anecdotally is, um, People with cerebral palsy often have um, structural disease that's bilateral, so both sides are affected. And tr the traditional 10-year, 15-year ago uh, um, thinking would be that's that's not a in it, you know that's somebody who wouldn't benefit from surgery. In the interim, we now have you know laser ablations. We have stereotactic surgeries of, of various forms. So now we've decreased the risk and potentially have the, the, the same benefit. And now we've changed the risk benefit profile, but um, not all seizure doctors are, you know, thinking along those lines or have access to all, to the newer stereotactic methods. Um, you know, I think there's a resistance to change meter that happens over time where if you've got somebody who's had epilepsy for two years, um, the resistance to change meter is here. And so when we talk to them, you know, they're, they're, um, we're much more likely to sort of make a connection with, okay, you know, there's something potentially better. If somebody's had, um, you know, epilepsy, res drug resistant epilepsy for 20 years or 10 years, they've, you know, kind of, for lack of a better term, gotten used to living with the daily seizures or, or, or um, frequent seizures, and they're much more skeptical, um, rightfully so, 
of you know somebody new that they've just met and and um, this new thing that they're hearing about. Um, are are there enough Dr. Ostendorf's? Uh, no, that's another problem. So um, there are uh, you know uh, about 250 or 260 epilepsy centers in the United States. Um, the majority of epilepsy surgery is not this type. And the majority of epilepsy surgery um, happens at a handful of centers um, where there's a few of us. So we definitely need more ep uh, epilepsy surgery people. So Dr. Novach, a great question. And I will say this is a topic that we wanna kind of have a side conversation about at our upcoming investigator meeting. So sounds like you'd be interested in that. We had a few people that were interested. It would be great to have a little dialogue about the potential to study this gap further. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, both. Dun Thank Duncan, you. Duncan and Amber, if you could both just be uh, respectful of the fact that we're at the end of the hour and one quick question, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, there was a young woman, about 29, GMFCS1, actually, very mobile, but with intractable epilepsy. How, besides making sure that her family sees the uh, uh, recording of tonight's webinar, how does one make a referral? to you all? So, um, yeah, that's an important uh, question. So the best way is, um, you know, sh she or anybody who's having intractable seizures should be seen at a level four. So any, you see National Association of Epilepsy Centers has different levels. So people with intractable epilepsy should be seen at a level four epilepsy center. Um, and that's because those centers have sort of the most, they're the most likely to have access to all these things. Um, and then the, the second one is uh, to have uh, an epilepsy specialist, uh, uh, typically an epilepsy specialist who, um, who is used to doing surgery or working with surgeons um, see her. So um, level four epilepsy center, and um, seeing an epilepsy specialist um, is, is the best way to see if she might benefit from surgery. And, and I do not, that, she does make annual trips to Ann Arbor, so. I'd be curious what that, what that resource is that gives you the four different levels of epilepsy centers. Um, it'd be there, the NEC's, um, uh, here, I'm gonna stop sharing. It's, I'll give you the website in the chat. Okay, great. And they have a good resource to search for an epilepsy center near you. That's great. Amber, do you wanna wrap up with the last question? Yeah, I, I think you've already answered um, the question, but I, I was gonna ask what other epilepsy surgeries were available other than the hemispherectomy. And I think you answered that in the list. There's more to that. Uh, yeah, Amber, the, the list of epilepsy surgery types is has been growing by the year essentially because of some technologies and then the way people are using the technologies. But there's a, a large um, focus on doing things more focused and more with minimally invasive surgery. And so um, I, could give, I could name you a list. It would be this long. Uh, next year, it'll probably be a little bit longer. OK, let me, uh, let me wrap okay, this thank, up. Thank you. Dr. Ostendorf, Ostendorf, I used to pronounce your name the right way. Um, thank you so much. I love the sort of uh, careful, thoughtful presentation, the content, it makes it so consumable. Uh, and for the work that you're doing, I know that everybody that uh, has a loved one or is experiencing epilepsy appreciates uh, your work. So thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Paul, thank you so much you. for uh, inviting me to come talk. Thank you for everybody for, um, for attending. And then I also want to call out, I see Dr. Roy Elterman is also on the call and he 
uh, is the chair of the Pediatric Epilepsy Research Foundation, which was really generous with funding um, funding this work. So uh, shout out to Dr. Elterman who, who was able to join us. Yeah. Agreed, thank you for joining and thanks everybody for joining. Thank you everybody, right. have a great night. Yeah, good evening. Thank you.